happening, you guys? I can't remember the last time I said the F word. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. Is it on the tip of your tongue? Like if you if you step on a Lego in the middle of the night? Uh, no, but something really good. SOB like is my go-to swear word when I have to swear. Mm. I you love say that. it like that, SOB? No, no, no. Ever, have you guys, either of you ever been bitten by a hamster in the middle of the night? <laughs> no. I have. <laughs> My kid's hamster, when we were in, when we were living in Cali, his hamster got loose in the middle of the night. And actually, it was loose for like three or four days. We couldn't find it. We'd see it. There'd be sightings, but he would always get away and get somewhere under a thing or something. Mm-hmm. And then I went to the bathroom and he was hiding in the laundry pile on the floor. <laughs> And as I was coming out of the bathroom, it latched onto my toe and just bit oh. me. <laughs> Are we recording yet? We need this on video. You said some choice words, didn't you? I woke up my wife and a couple of the kids. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. It was dark. You know, you try not you try to stay asleep. Is it bleeding? No, but it was he broke the skin a little bit. I mean, it was, you know. Did did the hamster get like kicked or stopped on or no, I did catch him though. And oh, he went good. back in his cage. All right. I'm going to record the podcast now. Okay. And we'll do the intro. So you have been recording. I recorded this on uh, Zoom. Okay. Here is we it, go. It is recording on Zoom. Mm-hmm. I do have, before we go in that, I've got a horrific nighttime experience that I can share with you guys. Better than the hamster thing. I, so uh, we have these <laughs> cats. <laughs> the hamster thing. It's going to crush you with that. So the we had these three cats and one of our cats is epileptic and um, that cat's no longer with us, but um, so the cat was in bed with us and started to have like a little bit of a sort of a seizure and mm. her paws went up and her claw hung in my eyelid Ow. and was fully engaged in there. Like, I, I, I mean, I'm fully asleep and all of a sudden there's a, like my eyelids are being pulled. My eyelid is being pulled. It's the worst, scariest, weirdest How? Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> and Lisa's next and to me I, all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, number 34, I'm I don't screaming know and Lisa doesn't know what's happening. And uh, it was, that was quite a way to wake up. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> For those listening to the podcast version, my hamster story was way better. Anyway. I don't know. He got bit by a hamster. <laughs> little hamster. Cute little hamster. So, okay. Let's get this started. I was going to tell you another one, right. but I'll hold it for next time. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators, and we've all been working for about the last 25 years. And in that time, we've published together somewhere around 50 books, and we've all taught illustration at the university level. Yep. Each week we're going to come at you with a different topic and we are going to argue or we going to, we bleh, are going to agree occasionally, <laughs> but each week you're going to learn something new. That's great. That was bad. Um, I want to ask you two guys a question. What if you could make money off of an illustration or some illustrations that you did in college, like way back in college? That's a, uh, how how I did. cool would you take that? You did? Mm-hmm. Not not right, not back in college, but like today. Today, but the work was from back then. But the work was from back then. I'd say no way. And I've, I've, I just this past week threw away probably 15 original paintings that weren't what? even from all the way back then. I just don't like them. And I've made money on them. I've, I, I've sold them even as prints and I just don't like them. And I just threw away all the originals. Well, let me tell you about Gina Lee. Have you heard of her? I know, the name sounds familiar, but I don't know who that is. Well, she just taught a class for us for SVS. That's <laughs> why she sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Gina. Ball. Gina. Sorry. Didn't. I thought you said Tina. Yeah, we yeah, thought you said Tina. You, you got to enunciate better. <laughs> Gina Lee, she taught a licensing class for us last year. And in that licensing class, she 
showed an illustration that I don't know how much money she's made off of it through licensing, but it was an illustration she did in college and, uh, and she licensed it and now it gets printed on like, it's like kind of a 4th of July looking illustration of an old Chevy truck, like a fifties Chevy truck. And it gets reprinted on like these flag banners you would, you might put out on your, on your lawn. Um, I think it's been reprinted on like cups and paper plates and things like that. But in this class, she goes through and she tells how you can take existing artwork that you've already done or how to prep new artwork for the licensing world, how to find, um, uh, you know, op- opportunities to license your work, how to navigate that whole scene. And we're releasing, um, just this week, we're releasing uh, a second part to this class that goes into trend forecasting. Like, how do you know what is going to be licensed in the next few years so you can make artwork that's going to work for that? Um, it talks about how you can um, uh, develop your personal style so that it, it it's more uh, desirable for licensors. And she goes into vision boards. How do you make a vision board to show you... Um, uh, basically how to direct your work into the direction of, of what you might want to do for licensing. So check that out. It's only at svslearn.com. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Very cool. Have you guys done much licensing? I have not. I am dipping my toe into it now. Actually, I'm working with a company who's making um, iPhone cases with my artwork on it. So... Yeah, it's a, it's a it's an interesting kind of uh, arena. I, I licensed a bunch of images to Trader Joe's last year, mm. and they made cards out of them and stuff like that. And it's just a fun way because the images are already done, and yeah. so you just sell them the rights to use the image on you know these various places, and you get a check. It's kind of fun. So, are you gonna go dig those paintings out of the trash? I just can't yeah. do it. I just, I, I, if I don't like a painting, I'm going to pull it out. I don't want it hanging on people. So I, the argument I always get with that is just give it to me. I'd like it. And if you're going to throw it away anyway, why don't you give it to me? But I hate knowing that work that I don't like is on someone's wall. <laughs> you know, this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, I'm reading this book called Keep Going by Austin Kleon. It's, uh, he's the guy that wrote Steal Like an Artist several years ago. I don't know if you ever saw that book, but this is like his... If, if this is a trilogy, this would be the third book in a trilogy. The second one was showing your work. This one's keep going. And it's all about how to stay creative um, as life progresses, even if you get like worn down or whatever. Um, um, but one section in there, he's like, create for the sake of creating. And he talks about how one thing you could do as an artist is make a drawing and then immediately put it in the shredder or burn it or throw it away. And he's like, he he pulls his kid, points to his kid as an example. Like the kid doesn't care about um, the end product. He only cares about the experience of creating. And there's something uh, uh, energizing and, and even more deeply creative about that. Just the fact that you get to make marks on paper and you're not so much thinking about what's this going to be when I'm done? Uh, you know, do I need to scan it? Does it go in a book? Does it, is it concept art for another piece? Is it, you know, am I learning what I need to learn from this piece? But, but sometimes that can take the soul out of creating and this is a, a way to put it back into it. That's how I got my career. Destroying your artwork? <laughs> no, just oh. like making marks and just doing weird things. And then all of a oh, sudden, yeah. here I am as an illustrator. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Well, today's topic, uh, uh, I wanted to talk about how to convey a message or story with your art. And actually, this topic, we were tagged by another podcast. There's a podcast called Kick, Kick in the Creatives. And they uh, they came up with like this this idea where they're going to do a topic and then they want to hear other art related podcasts do their take on the topic. So they emailed me and said, Hey, we're doing this. Can we tag you? And then you tag another podcast to, to do the topic as well. And then we can link to everybody and talk about, you know, everybody could see all of our different takes on this subject matter. So I took them up on that offer. And, uh, um, and so the, the message or the, not the message, but the topic is how to convey a message with your art. And I think it's really good for us as illustrators, because that's what we're all about. Every piece of ours tells some sort of story 
or share some sort of message. So, but before we get into that, I just want to tag another podcast called One Fantastic Week. And I want to have them do their take on this, um, on this thing too. So uh, the ball's in your court, guys. One t- fantastic week. And let's, let's hear what you guys have to, uh, have to say about this, this same subject matter. Okay, so let's get down into it. I'm going to, I'll steer the show. It's mine today. So I want to focus on the storytelling part, um, and maybe not so much the message part that we'll, we'll get into that later, but um, starting off, I, I want to tell a story that I overheard Will talking about with the class he recently did for svslearn.com. Was it drawing backgrounds, right? With Brian. Mm-hmm. And what was the thing that, so Brian is this amazing illustrator, Brian Ajar. And a, it's, it's pronounced Ajar. Ajar. And he'll correct you. It's, it's funny. He had to correct me like five times during that class. I call him Ajar because that's what you call him. I know. That's how you say it. I know. I, I <laughs> messed you up. It's, okay, like, it's, Brian, like, it's a, like a jar of peanut butter or something. Yeah. Or the door is a jar. Right. There's probably others. That we could come up with too. In a yeah, second. let's just keep going. <laughs> when is the door not a door? When it's a jar. Um, so Brian Ajar is this illustrator uh, who is really good at like um, telling a story with with his illustrations, with his images. And so you guys were teaching this class, and what was one of the the things that one of the the problems with the students that just kept popping up? with some of the problems was that they would uh, tell a story fragment. So it would be like, we would look at their art. And then this was after we were, you know, fairly clear about having a, a story to illustrate. Like, like in, in one panel, we need to be able to look at the art and tell what's happening. And it seems simpler than it is. Mm-hmm. But it's actually in reality, when you try to do it, it's, it's a lot more complex. But basically his critique was on like maybe seven out of 10 was, I don't know what the story is. So it could be this or it could be that. And and I was in the class with him and I'm going, yeah, I think maybe it's, it's this. Okay. Well then, and since we were recording these critiques without the, the student there on some, a lot of them, we would guess. Mm-hmm. And then we would say, well, if you were trying to tell this story, this is how we would, this is what we would do differently to make it more, to reinforce that, that story. Yeah. And so I, what I, what I pulled from that was um, just because you're drawing a picture doesn't mean your picture's saying anything. Doesn't mean your, your audience, the people viewing it are getting anything more out of it than just this is a character or this is an environment. And I think that's a problem that you see a lot of times with amateur uh, amateur illustration work is there's just no story happening in the image. There's nobody wanting to know what's going on or, or uh, no question being asked. And we want to help people solve that question or solve that problem in this episode today. How do you get your pictures to tell a story? Why should you even do that? Let me ask you guys that. Why should a illustration tell a story? Is it good enough just to, you know, illustrate a picture of the woods and leave it at that? You know, should it, should it do more than that? Lee? I think it needs to have longevity. I mean, if something's going to be interesting for a long period of time, it needs to have a story and, and hopefully a story that doesn't get full. The other side of what you're saying here, where, where they don't ask or they don't tell a story at all is where they tell just too much of it. And so the viewer doesn't have any work to do. You can't participate in it. So there's a real nice middle ground for a good image that, that kind of invites a story that you can come back to again and again. And depending on where you are in life, you can maybe read the image in a different way. Um, and that becomes a, a very engaging long-term thing. Whereas somebody just paints a, you know, a barn. I don't know why everybody paints barns, by the way, but um, they just paint a barn, you know, unless it's just technically flawless or there's something with it, you're just not going to be that interested in it in it long-term. So I think that's why it needs to tell a story. And the other reason to go along with that is, is at least in, in thinking about this class, I pulled up <clears throat> a couple of the images from that class that we critiqued is, if you're not telling a specific story, often the, the stuff you draw 
actually ask different questions. Mm -hmm. And so you end up, you end up asking questions. Is that, was that your intent as an illustrator is to ask questions or to answer them? Mm. You know what I mean? And so, mm -hmm. so for instance, uh, I can give you an example. There's a, there's an image that I'm looking at right now and that doesn't help people that are listening to the podcast, but um, there's a, there's a, a woman in the foreground and she's happy and she's kind of looking over her shoulder a little bit. And then there's a dog that's really happy and he's kind of following her. And then there's a little girl in the background that's really upset. And there's nothing in the image to tell you why she's upset and why the woman's happy. So we're like, is, is the mom happy that she just disciplined the kid? Is she trolling her own kid? You know, like mm -hmm. it looks like she's almost got glee that her kid's upset, but we're like, that's probably not the story. So in other words, it's asking questions mm -hmm. and that's not really the, that's not really the job of a narrative illustrator. Yeah. I think that gets in the realm of fine art. You know, you look at uh, an Andrew Wyeth piece yeah. and you're just like, what is going on, and on yeah. here? Who is this person? You know, why is she looking at that building? You know, that house on the, on the horizon. Right. Um, I think too, like the barn paintings thing, um, they're, they're being painted. Um, and, and I, you know, Dave Dibble, who we've, who we all know who's been on our third Thursday things last a couple of years ago, he does amazing barn paintings, like the light, the mm -hmm. shadow, gotta be just perfect. the, just the way that he captures them, but he's not illustrating. Those barn paintings are for a specific reason. They're for a rich person to hang on their wall at their cabin. <laughs> they're, right? yeah, they're, they're decoration, basically they're decoration. Right. And, and, and they do a great, job at that but is your job as an illustrator is to do more than that your job as an illustrator is to tell a story so i think i've got a, a list here <laughs> that i want to go through and we'll kind of nailed nailed the first one is that oh, oops sorry no it's it's fine we're fine okay. I, I i want it to be kind of organic like that but number one hey wait can i before you get into your list can i just make one uh, statement it's a disclaimer yes. I forgot what? that we're, <laughs> I forgot that we're now recording the video. And so uh -huh. I'm just you know, playing with these two pencils and like hitting myself in the head with them and poking myself in the face with these pencils. And now I just realized that that's going to be recorded. <laughs> it didn't bother me at all because I knew that you had forgotten. And I was like, this is cool. I'm not going to know that you. up my nose right now. And uh, so if you guys see the YouTube version <laughs> We know that you're a, a six-year-old in a, a, a middle-aged man's body. So that's completely it's, fine. It's very true. Anyway, so I apologize for uh, those of you guys who are watching me and just see me fidget with stuff. I'm now going to do my newscaster look and be very serious. Don't do that. <laughs> for, for those in podcast land, we, uh, we're doing a video version for this that we're going to post on YouTube um, whenever we get around to that after it, after it goes after the podcast is posted. So that's what's going on there. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. My list. Can I talk about my list? Number one. Here's <laughs> wait, how you wait, tell wait, wait. What? I just wanted to <laughs> <A> little turkey. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, I'm going to get a sidetrack now too. My kid this morning, he goes, hey, what are some other birds names that we can use as like to call a name on somebody? Like when someone doesn't want to do something, they're chicken. And when someone's being really annoying, they're a turkey. And I'm like, so we just started coming up with stuff and I started like bowing and they're all, what are you? I'm all, I'm a duck. <laughs> I was bowing. Oh, wow. That's the, the kids thought it was funny. Wow. Okay. <laughs> 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 anyway, back to my list. Uh, how to tell a story with your art. Number one, every image should, um, should we say, elicit some kind of emotional response from a viewer, from the viewer. So it should make them laugh. Um, it should make them uh, interested or wanting to know more of the story, right? It shouldn't like, maybe it shouldn't puzzle them, but it should make them like, want to know either, um, you know, who this character is and, and want to, you know, turn the page to find mm -hmm. out what happens next, that type of thing. Or uh, the, the image could, what did I say? Make a laugh, make them curious, make them angry, maybe, uh, is another thing. 
inspire them or, or give them awe of some kind. You know, when I look at really cool concept art, you know, for a movie, like a, a um, visual development piece that shows like an exciting scene in a movie, more often than not, the feeling I have is, is like, oh, I really want to see this movie. Like, I really want to see these characters, you know, go through this adventure, something like that. So every illustration should, should go into it with some sort of, how am I going to get some sort of emotional response from the viewer. All right. So that's, that's the first thing I have on my list. Let me, let me add something mm-hmm. that I, a caveat that I should have put in there before. Cause I said, you shouldn't be asking questions as an illustrator, but there actually is a really good time to ask a question. And that's kind of what you mentioned with when you're talking about sequential art and getting a page turn. So there could be an action that doesn't resolve until the next page. Mm-hmm. Right. So we don't, so in other words, uh, there's a, there's a kid going down a hill in his on his skateboard and he's going super fast and then he starts to fall on one page and then you flip the page over and you find out what the aftermath was yeah i like that okay in that one little thing hold on that that um yeah let lee add something i'm scared to say anything though because i don't want to jump ahead yeah we don't want to ruin your list jake but we don't know what the list is but i was going to say that you know you're saying that that the goal is to have some kind of, uh, you know, desired response. And typically in illustration, that response is, should be the same for the broad audience. Whereas fine art, it could be, you know, they look at the, whatever the fine art is and have a different experience. But most of the time as an illustrator, if you, if you're doing a scary illustration for, you know, scary book or whatever, Mm -hmm. you want everybody to feel that same way. And so there's kind of an intent behind it. I like that. That's really good. Um, uh, what, how about this? I'll just go through my list one at a time. <laughs> don't, just, don't laugh. This is, I'm being very serious right now. Oh. <laughs> um, I'll go through my list and just ask you guys, I'll say the next thing on my list and then I'll ask you guys, do you have examples or can you think of uh, a way that this has worked in your own art? How, that, that way the list doesn't get trampled, but we still get feedback from everybody. Sure. Does that sound good? Yeah. Let's have, let's have a clean list. Respect the list. (laughs) Okay. So number two goes right along with, um, with, uh, with what we were saying there, I would say always include a character or some sort of evidence of a character. Does that make sense? How does, how does that worked in your, we're afraid to respond. (laughs) What? We're afraid to respond. (laughs) Did I I all of a sudden get bad at doing a podcast? (laughs) No, No, I don't think that I was. What you're saying is don't put, don't make your images just decorative. Like, Mm -hmm. so I was actually giving a critique for a guy with his portfolio last week. And the first image that he had on his portfolio, he's actually one of our SVS students. Mm -hmm. Um, And... I don't want to out him, but I told you, Lee, that I talked to him. Yes. Anyway. But his name rhymes with Schmenjabin. <laughs> <laughs> no, his first, his first image was actually one of his best images, and I know that's why he put it first. Mm-hmm. As far, but it was one of his best as far as craftsmanship, color, texture, all of the above. But it didn't have a character. There was no story in it. So, mm-hmm. so I'm like, what are you, I asked him, what are you saying to potential, because he wants to do children's book, he wants to get children's book clients. What does it say if you, on your very first image? And that's a tough thing because when you, when you're, when you're kind of newer as an illustrator, you'll make these, I call them pinnacle pieces. You'll, you'll, you'll make a piece that's better than everything else in your portfolio. Mm-hmm. And so you want to share it. You want people to see it. And you might even want to put it as the lead off image in your portfolio. But in this case, it was setting the perfectly wrong tone in that it was decorative. It might as well have been a fine art piece, you know, beautiful barn. It's funny that it had a barn in there and it had a, it had a, uh, a, a rooster in the foreground and, but, it, but there was no story. So. Yeah. Why do you think it is that, that you need that character in, in the image or evidence of a character. And, and by evidence, I mean, 
if you don't want to put a character in there, then if it is a landscape, maybe there's a castle on the horizon, or maybe there's a, a um, you know, a, a, an old rusty car that's like falling apart in the corner or something like that. I think there's a spot in our brain that, you know, like if you see a, a, a gnarled tree branch or whatever, where you start to see faces in that. And I think we just are programmed to find people and we're programmed to mm -hmm. put ourselves in different situations and stuff. And if, it, if, if it's an environment with no sense that a person has ever been there, I mean, it almost looks like a travel photo, but you can't mm -hmm. really be a part of the yeah. story. I and mean, you put the rusty car there. Now, all of a sudden, the whole thing starts to set up. There's a time frame that's involved in that. How did the car get there? What, you know, who drove the car? Yeah. What happened to them? I mean, it just starts to ask so many questions and it gets that, gets that whole, you know, sequence started. You could right. tell a story. I think there are a few exceptions, but I think in 90 some percent of the time, you're going to want a character there, but I could think of one just in recent, um, just what happened this week with the um, cathedral of Notre Dame catching fire. There could potentially be a children's book on the, the fire of Notre Dame. You know, there, well, you know, there are some serious children's books that tackle serious issues. And that's why I say there needs to be at least evidence that there was a character. Oh, I see. Yeah. So then that would work. Either yeah. Because character in the image or yeah. evidence that's because you, you could have a distant shot of, of the cathedral burning mm -hmm. and it sure would be telling a story, but yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't hear you caveat. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you have a big snowscape, that's one kind of scene, but then you have a snowscape with just footprints in the snow. It's a totally different yeah. image and, and a much better image in my opinion yeah. as an illustrator. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, the next one I want to say to tell a story with your art is to use small details to hint at more depth to the situation. And that kind of goes right along with what you're saying about the, the footprints. But what I like to do is, um, you know, if, if I have a character in there, I will give the character some sort of quirky uh, addition to their outfit or uh, maybe they're riding something interesting or maybe if they're on like a, a horse, the horse has, you know, it's carrying all sorts of equipment behind them um, because these details, I, let me ask you this. Why, why do you think little details like that help to tell a story? Will Terry. <laughs> I was waiting for Lee. I wanted, he looked like he was ready to answer this. Okay. Lee. <laughs> I can answer. Well, I think I think the details that go along with the scene start uh, start to become character building. And the example I use in class is like if you go to a, a brand new neighborhood that, you know, just just got put up, it sort of looks like a monopoly kind of neighborhood, no matter what the style is, you know, the, all the houses just seem so generic, you know, you fast forward. 50 years and somebody's lived in a house for 50 years, all of a sudden that the little details around the location start to point to who the person is who lives there. And it becomes very specific. It's not just a generic box with a roof on it. It's now a, 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 an extension of that character. And so I think all details are extensions of the character. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Let me, let me add to that in that the natural thing that I've noticed that students do is they will, uh, there, there's a reticence to use reference early on. Uh, there's a, there's a, it's, it's, a, it's an acquired skill to spend more time um, preparing for an illustration mm -hmm. than it is to just dive right in and start drawing and just boom, 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 now I'm done. And I had that disease when I was in school where I'd get an assignment and two hours later I'd be done and I'd be going, okay, what's next? And my teacher's <laughs> like, well, well, hold on now. Like, let's take a look at this thing. And, and I, a lot of my other classmates had that. And I, now I see that a lot in students where – They'll draw, let's, let's say, for, for example, and this is an illustration I'm thinking of right now that one of our students did, where it was, it was on a street corner and the car that they put in this illustration definitely looked contemporary. And then the, but, the, but it was at a bus stop on the street. So there's a bus stop there and there's a bench there. And the, the, the bench that the student drew was completely made up out of his head. And it, it looked really boxy. It didn't look like a bench that I had ever seen before. It didn't remind me of any bus stop bench that I'd ever seen before. It didn't. Now, it could have existed. Someone could have potentially 
made a bench like this, but in my 50 years of living on Some this earth, I soul could have never <laughs> saw one look like this. And the, when you, when you're talking about details, you could draw a, a, a bench in a park and you could probably, if you did your research based on different periods of time in history and different places in the world, you could probably draw 20 benches that looked better than the one that he drew that, that actually brought you to a specific time period or place, you know, so, um, and, uh, it, so anyway, I guess the point that I'm, I'm saying is that bench that he drew took me right out of the story that he was trying to tell because mm-hmm. it was distracting. So pay attention to the details as well. Like even, even, a, um, uh, something as simple as a bench, if done wrong, could draw too much attention to it in a way, in a way that doesn't help yeah. your overall picture. Which brings up a good a good um, question is, if you're trying to develop your own style, does that mean you have to draw a bench that some other architect or designer came up with always? Well, I, th- I think there, going there, it's um, if the bench is consistent with your style, then then it won't stand out. But if everything else looks how it's supposed to look, and then you have this wonky looking bench. Yeah, you can't make up an entire universe that has no reference point for the viewer. Right. I can't say this. That one in one of my books, I sort of messed up on a detail. And um it was it it was a book I did uh, about two or three years ago called Arctic White. And the it was um this Eskimo girl, and she's with her father, and they're going to view this these northern lights, but it takes place in very kind of rural conditions, you know, with the, with the animal pelts and the, and the, the dogs and stuff, the sleds. And um, she gets a, she's really sick of seeing um, all the gray, you know, like sky's gray, the snow is, has no color. And so midway through the book, she discovers color. She wants to start seeing color and stuff. And so she starts painting and the palette that I gave her looks like she went to Walmart and bought it. Mm. <laughs> and I should have like everything else was so like um, I don't want to say indigenous, um, but if, if that's the right word, <laughs> leaning that way, you know, where it's so it all natural. It's, so yeah, part of the natural world um, that I don't think she would have had this like just you know, plastic <laughs> right. palette that these, she got. These colors that were made in a factory. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I think it, w- it would have been a better storytelling opportunity if they kind of ground up the pigments or something like that, uh, put it on a wood wood bowls or something. Would have yeah. probably been a better call. Um, it didn't, it didn't ruin the book. It's just a small little detail. But now when I go back and, and, and see the book, it is a detail that I, that I wish I would have changed because it could have had more, uh, like, like Will said, if it's the wrong palette, I don't want anybody to be pulled out of it and be like, wait, is there a 7-Eleven around the corner from this igloo? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point yeah so look at the details in your in your piece and see if any of the details are are detracting from the image or they're actually helping the image all right so the next one uh, i'm calling it avoid the climax so in your illustration your illustration should never be the climax of any sort of event <laughs> it's what it should be is either an image that shows something that's happening right before the climax or something that's uh, happened right afterwards. So, you know, let's say uh, uh, a kid's running down the sidewalk and he trips, uh, you know, on a stick in the sidewalk and falls and skins his knee. If you were going to illustrate that in a children's book, what would you illustrate? The actual tripping part where he's like, the knee is scraping on the ground or um, the thing leading up to it where, you know, the kids, you, you could see that he's going to hit this stick and it's going to be disastrous. Or right afterwards, there's a stick, you know, that's broken on the ground, the kid's crying. You know, which of those three illustrations is the most uh, story, it has the most story power in it? Uh, it's a great, you, great you, topic. This, I mean, I have this a whole section on this on my storytelling video. Um, and by the way, I should add that this is the topic of, of the SVS contest this month, which is um, the moment before. Is that April or May? That's for April. 
So it's going on right. It's going on right now. This podcast airs in May. So (laughs) uh, so you guys can check out how people did it. But one of the like when we were talking about um, good examples from it is the jaw, the classic Jaws poster. You know, big shark coming up from the water. The Mm -hmm. swimmer's not aware of the shark, but the viewer is. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful moment of showing that right before the actual act, you know, activity or action part of that sequence takes place. Um, It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of my favorite things to illustrate is when the view, when you as the illustrator bring the viewer in on information that not all the characters in the illustration know about. Right. Yeah. That's really good. And I noticed in the book that you just did, Will, the Bonaparte baseball book, Mm -hmm. what's it called? Bonaparte hits a home run? Plays ball. Bonaparte plays ball. Bonaparte plays ball. Um, There's a shot where Bonaparte, spoiler, um, hits a home run right at mm-hmm. the end oh. and i'm sorry sorry thanks a lot <laughs> <laughs> i know you're waiting for that to be published and uh and come out for for you to find out what actually happens but um uh, just in that one illustration there um the i remember i was talking about it the debate was do you show the ball actually contacting the bat mm. you know is that more powerful or do you show the ball the question was, is the ball about to hit the bat or did it hit the bat, you know, already? And it's on its way out. And even in that like split second moment, there's some decisions that could be made to, that could change the, uh, the, the impact of the storytelling. Mm-hmm. And so uh, again, if you avoid the climax, you, you, uh, or, or I guess the, the pinnacle of the spurring of the action, um, you, you, it's actually kind of boring to see that ball contacting the bat. Like that's not dynamic. Mm -hmm. What you want is, is he going to hit a home run or, Oh, he hit a home run, you know, like this is awesome. Right. So, um, so that's just another example I was thinking of. And a lot of the storytelling in that particular one was on the, the following page where the people in the stands are looking up, making different facial expressions, watching the ball go out. Yeah, you know, that's really cool. One thing that I like to comment on about this um, playing with the moment of act, of activity or action is the different sounds that kind of come with it, or the different um, level of activity, I guess. But I, I like to equate it to sound, um, and whether something's quiet or whether something's loud. And a lot of times in my books, I think about the pacing that way. Like, do I want a really loud image right now? Do I want something a little quieter? Do I need to lead up to something? Mm. And so it's kind of fun to break down those, those three specific scenes that, that a lot of times the moment right before something has a very kinetic kind of, in, or excuse me, a potential energy. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a heightened sense of energy, but it's not a loud kind of scene. Like somebody that say lighting a fuse to dynamite. You know, there's, it's, it's kind of pregnant with, with potential. And then the explosion of that piece of dynamite is very, very loud. Typically, if you're doing the action of, of a sequence, you know, during hitting the home run or blowing up a dynamite, it's very loud. And that moment, if I need some really loud kind of thing, I'll pick that moment. And then the aftermath is a lot of times quieter. So like, you know, a bomb has exploded and, or the dynamite has exploded. And now, uh, you know, it's just the, the, the remnants of what happened afterwards. Everything's kind of torn down or whatever. And it's a quieter kind of scene then too. So depending on what moment you need or what the story needs at that time, I'll kind of play with the moment that way. That's cool. Another thing that people make mistakes on in doing when you're talking about action is they'll over, they'll put too many, when you're talking about sequences, they'll put too many pieces in and they're not allowing the viewer to, or the reader to, to fill in the gaps. Yeah. So they'll, so they'll, uh, how do you, what's your advice on that, Jay? Cause you're more of a comic book guy. And I find that the animators are better at this than most illustrators. Most, most illustrators are not as natural at knowing what, what to leave out is just as important as what to put in. Yeah. When you're looking at animators work, what are you seeing that's successful there? Will? when I, Oh, well, let's take Roadrunner. You, you remember the, the cartoon, the old cartoon, the Roadrunner? That was like the, to me, the perfect storytelling with, with action. Cause there were so many things left out that if you analyze it, you realize you never saw certain impacts or certain things. Right. You saw aftermaths and. Mm-hmm. 
I think with, with animation, um, so much of it is anticipation, especially when you, you said the Roadrunner mm-hmm. uh, cartoons. Um, you, you, you sit down to watch a Roadrunner cartoon. You know Coyote's not going to get the Roadrunner. You already know that. But you're still <laughs> thinking maybe this is the one. It's because 90% of that cartoon is watching this, this Coyote put together like these crazy plans and it's, you know, the camera panning along and he's hammering, you hear the hammering noise and you see all these empty crates from the Acme supply store. And finally you see this contraption, this dumb contraption that he's made. (laughs) And, and you don't even have to like spend hardly any time of him pursuing the roadrunner it's just him planning and thinking about it mm-hmm. and that right there is like in a nutshell of what kind of what, what you could do with with your illustrations is putting in all these little details all these little hints all this anticipation that lead the viewer to you know ask them a question like what do you think is going to happen and you can put in enough hints in there that that they may have a good idea of what you know the next thing is if not that they're dying to know by turning the page, what the outcome is going to be. And the question isn't, you know, what's he going after? Or, you know, I mean, actually, that's a perfectly valid, you know, if you had a kid who's going on a bear hunt, you know, or something like that, and he's got, you know, his little pop gun, uh, but he's, you know, he's got all this other stuff that he's put together to make a giant bear trap. And you're wondering, like, you know, maybe he's looking down the hole and he sees that the trap's You've been set and something has fallen in there. You're wondering, did he get a bear? Did he get a bear cub? Did he get a dragon? You know, um, it's, it's all those little details. It's, it's, you know, it, it wouldn't be a fun illustration if you saw the thing that he got halfway falling through the hole. Mm-hmm. You know, that doesn't, it doesn't leave anything to the imagination. So I want to talk, talk about the next thing you can look at to help tell a story with your illustration that's use composition or the point of view to tell the story when have you guys seen this in in student work or even in your own experience when have you seen this like be like really screwed up (laughs) like have you seen anybody mess this up where the composition or the point of view just did not work to tell tell a story with the illustration i I think it's it takes a little bit of experience for people to go for a true worm's eye or bird's eye view, which can be so much more engaging. Anytime something is going to be very tall or very small, those are the first things that I start thinking about is, oh, I want to look extreme down angle, extreme up angle. Mm-hmm. And um, I think a lot of times people just take kind of this general camera angle. That's you know, almost it's, like we're walking around, you know, your general line of sight. That mushy middle. The worst mm-hmm. for me is, and I, I see this so much in like amateur s- student work, is it, it may be a perspective drawing where there's clearly some perspective happening, but the POV is like 12 feet above where the eyes should be. So we're kind of, we're not a bird's eye view. <laughs> we're not even an eye level view. It's just like, we're here floating 12 feet above the ground, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's, 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 that speaks to an evolution of your art because when you first yeah. start drawing, you don't think about, well, if one, you're incapable you don't have the skills to put the camera in different places, mm-hmm. let alone think about that being an option. Right. 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 And then as you develop later on in, in some of these classes, we start talking about the, like, well, you know, you could put the camera, what are you talking about camera? You're the director. You mm-hmm. get to, you get to wear a lot of hats as an illustrator. And one of them is you're the director. So the director gets to decide what kind of camera angle you're going to use. Or maybe it got decided in a meeting with with the maybe the storyboard artist came up with some panels that looked really cool and they were like, oh, that's perfect. Let's go with that. So maybe the storyboard artist is the one that actually, you know, some of their ideas of where the camera got placed got put into the film. But as you're when you're the illustrator, that's an option. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, sorry, I just got a call from my wife. Had to Go ahead and off. take it. <laughs> yes, yeah, don't don't bother with us. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll just keep it going. Let's Lee. Let's make up the list. <laughs> uh, David and I have it have have an assignment in our in our illustration class. David Hone uh-huh. and I've been teaching this class for years, and the first assignment we we give is 
uh, it's a teacup assignment and people have to do, the students have to do 50 thumbnails of this teapot and teacup. And that's the only things they can include in the image. And so it really is about flying, zooming in, zooming out, going over, mm. coming oh, up under. Good it's a good one. Cause once they're about at 20, you know, you got to start kind of tapping the pencil on the desk, like, okay, what else am I going to do? And that's when the drawings start to get really interesting and the compositions mm. start to become a little more interesting. That's cool. The other thing too, uh, not just POV, though that's a big part of it, but also compositionally, you could have a visual hierarchy that could tell a story. So sometimes you can, um, you know, when a person rolls up onto your, your image, they'll notice right off the bat something that's very dominant visually. And you could use that to, to, to like to your advantage because maybe the story is happening uh, the real story is happening behind that image um, or behind that main, you know, thing that that's drawing your attention. And what that does is it helps, um, it, it sort of gives the, 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 the viewer something to explore. So they're, they're faced with this, you know, let's say it's an image of a deserted Island and right there, you've got this volcano and the volcano's erupting, something like that. And so your, your attention is drawn to this volcano. But when you give it a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, a second, you know, look at it, you see, you know, villagers like escaping the boats and you see, you know, all this other little detail happening, you know, building a wall to stop lava and stuff like that. And that's actually the next one I want to talk about is give your viewer something to explore. Mm. You can use POV, you can use composition, but adding detail or adding some sort of, um, uh, you know, hidden, maybe even hidden stuff in there that just, the more they look at it, the more they're wanting to, to see. Have you seen good examples of that either in your own work or in, in other work? Let me give a great example in my own work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a genius. <laughs> you set me up for that one, Jake. Yeah. Um, I, I'll go back to my, my, my first Bonaparte book. And this is something that uh, I think you can just ask yourself as questions as you're illustrating along. So the, the main character is a skeleton, if you haven't seen it. And the skeleton has a lot of friends. He has a, a Frankenstein type friend. He has a, a black widow. He has a mummy. Just all the, the scary creatures, a werewolf, a witch. You're just going to name them all. I'm going to name them all. I'm trying to think, like, which ones am I missing now? Um, and a zombie. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, you should have done a slime monster. How cool would that be? Just a, a slime monster? Yeah, it'd be like a ghost, but it's just a, a slime ball. Like Slimer? Not Slimer, but actual slime, like a... Man, we're getting on a... Yeah, like, let's keep, no, this is good. I, I get well off topic. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that on its own. <laughs> okay, I'm just so. saying, let me just clarify. A ball of slime that has eyes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? That should be in the next book. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go. I'll talk to my editors for you. <laughs> so, uh, no, the, the image that I'm thinking of, though, is uh, when they introduce uh, her, his name or her name is Blackie Widow. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Black Widow, if you couldn't figure that out. And, uh, <laughs> and in Black Widow's house, I'm like, well, what kind of furniture? You know? And, it, and it, it's hard to just to describe it on a podcast. It's such a, it's a weird thing that we have this visual job that we do and we, mm -hmm. we have a podcast that's not visual. Don't it's, call attention to that. Why are you calling it? It's edit, weird. Edit. <laughs> Guys listening to this, edit. you're weird for even listening to this. Um, but anyway, no, I gave a, I gave, I gave the furniture a, uh, a, a spider web pattern. And then I scrolled the, the, the feet of it and um, made the architecture of the back of the chairs kind of like a spider web as well. And so those little details, I think, are important because it gives you something to look at beyond just the action that's happening in the room. You know, you got the spider there, but it's like, oh, so this is what a spider's house, the furnishings would look like. They have just a bunch of framed pictures of all the husbands she's eaten <laughs> on her wall. <laughs> <laughs> there were a few rejected ideas in there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> that's good. I also think of illustrations like Where's Waldo? Obviously, that's completely designed for exploration. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but you could use Where's Waldo elements to your illustrations too. Like, don't be afraid to add a ton of detail in there to to have have uh, the viewer to explore. There's this. Uh, I'll go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Lee. I was just gonna say, there's. I've got this book, and I, I can't remember. I want to give them credit. Maybe we will in the, in the show notes. It's uh, it's based around a Christmas Carol, but it's but it's mice. And it's just loosely based around a Christmas Carol. So I'm reading this book to my son and and um, going through the the spreads or whatever. And the details are all good, all mice kind of stuff. You know, little matchboxes for beds and you know all that kind of stuff. And Jake's playing with a little action figure right now. <laughs> yeah, trying to have a serious podcast. So only after after reading this book like four or five times did I notice that the actual human version of a Christmas Carol is taking place in the background of every scene of the mice. Whoa! Wow. It, it, it's incredible how well and subtle it was done. I mean, it, it, none of, it's always, a, I mean, it was a second read. Like I said, I, it took a few times of going through it to really pay attention to like, oh, wait, those aren't just like people in a city walking around back there. That's like the actual that's story. Scrooge and that's. Oh um, my gosh. Probably. It kind of like, it kind of sixth sense me. you like, remember at the end of the sixth sense, the first time you see Don't that. Spoil it. Like, Don't spoil it. I, I actually spoiled that movie for somebody. <laughs> oh, they haven't seen it in 20 years or whatever. That's what I said. That's what you get. But there's a there's a generation of of twenty year olds who haven't ever seen it. That's what me and Will found out. Oh, is, okay. Is it they just, it came out when they were really little, and then there were other movies to watch when they were old enough to see it. Yeah. So they haven't they haven't seen it. So and we should tell them that everybody dies. He didn't stop me. Yeah, Tanner did. Tanner didn't even know to stop you. No. <laughs> And then he's like, "So was I supposed to know that they were ever, that he was dead the whole time?" And I'm like, "I'm really sorry." Now you blew it again. Then you have the people like my mother-in-law who insists everybody's gotten it wrong that he was alive the whole time. Wait, what? Really? There's actually a cult <laughs> following. There's a cult following that thinks that. I love this woman to death. Of course there is. A conspiracy theory about <laughs> sixth sense. Of course yeah. there is. That all of us as the viewers were dead the whole time. Anyway, my point, let's get back on track. My point was sometimes the detail can be just fun stuff that you add to the story. Sometimes it can be essential stuff that you're adding to a story. Mm -hmm. um, I had to do a book. <laughs> now I'm distracted because Will's holding up little action figures. I had to do a story where I had to, there was a couple of questions in terms of the manuscript that I thought weren't answered well enough in the text. So I tried to work mm -hmm. in the answers and fill in some of those gaps in the illustrations, just in the yeah. details. The thing I like too about, um, the little critters books is the the spider. There's like a sp <laughs> there's like a spider or some sort of bug in every single illustration. And so, even though you're following the story, you just want to see where did the you know where was the spider hidden in this one? That's gold bug. Is that what it is? Richard Scary? Yeah. No. Yeah. Well. Yeah. He, he does that too. That's gold bug, sure. man. Yeah. <laughs> I just went through the whole book with my son trying to find that little gold bug on every shot. I'm actually jealous that you have a young kid still. Because mine are too old. I mean, you, you're getting market research still. I write him off as a tax deduction for that <laughs> business expense. <laughs> yeah, well, you don't, is this your first year? You don't get any tax exemption for your, for your kids, huh? Technically. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a dependent. I have a son that's got a disability. Okay. Yeah. So, there, there you so go. I've got that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, next there's no, one. There's no humor in that. We're trying to be lighthearted. I know. <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm like, he's going to make <laughs> you go there. Really <laughs> bummed us out. Sorry. <laughs> you don't get to pay taxes. Actually, I do. I have a. <laughs> my. I saw this disabilities, Jake. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, what's next on our list? We've been uh, moseying around this one. Okay, okay, here we go. Use lighting to tell the story. How can you use lighting to tell a story? I think sometimes mm -hmm. people even forget that that's an option. But just by changing the time of day in an illustration can mean a hundred things. Like if a, if a person's running through the forest and it's the middle of the day, that's one thing. If it's the middle of the night, that could mean something entirely different, right? So how, how have you seen people either forget that or mess it up, the lighting thing? 
Well, this is right up your alley. I, I, I used to use lighting a lot in my illustrations early on, and now I actually don't use lighting. I mean, I use time of day and seasonal kind of cues, but I don't use light. I don't use value that like a character gets hit with light on one side and has shadow on the other side. I don't do that anymore. Yeah. It's, a, it's a huge topic. Um, but rather than talk about how people get it wrong, I did an exercise for one of my classes where you I illustrated it. How you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm showing options, basically. So yeah. I illustrated an attic scene, the crowded attic with tons of, of objects mm -hmm. and a little boy. You know how you know how you have the, um, I don't know, the pull down stairs, the ones that hit Chevy Chase in the head during Christmas vacation, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what are those called? Stairs to the Pull attic. down stairs. Pull down stairs, ladder, pull down, pull down ladder, stairs. something like that. I'm sure German the Germans have an actual word for it. <laughs> anyway, a Blickenstoff, <laughs> something, like, whatever. Googling cool. that now. So he's 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 sticking his head up in in the attic, kind of like I was, you know, doing this earlier. Yeah. So his head is sticking through that hole, and uh, and you can see he's he's looking off to the side. This little boy is kind of looking off the side, like he's looking for something, or he heard a sound in the attic. And there's like toy, you know, there's an old toy monkey with the, the symbols toy up there. And there's uh there's a mannequin and there's all kinds of different, just different junk up there. And there's a snake that happens to be up in the attic. And I, I put things that don't even necessarily belong in an attic, but then I lit it. Um, like there was a kind of a spot of light coming through the attic window, hitting different parts of the illustration. And it told a totally different story on five different parts that it, that it was highlighting this little beam of light coming through the window. And because th now the principle is in your illustration, the, the place that gets the highest contrast is almost usually the focal point, unless you introduce a color like red or orange, some warm, really warm accent color mm -hmm. um, that's by itself. So I think that's, that's pretty much usually the hierarchy. If you, if you introduce a saturated red, into your illustration in one place that will almost always become the focal point. Second to that is the highest contrast. Do I have that right, Lee? That's right. Or, okay. So we, we, we haven't checked each our teaching methods with each other before. So I have yeah. to, I have no, to that's check. right. That's right on the money in terms of what it, I believe it to be. Okay. So the highest contrast point becomes often becomes the focal point. And usually that's, you know, if, if you've got a, if you're dealing with an interior, even at, at night, if you've got a beam of light where the light hits often is the place that's the highest contrast. If there's shadows around or other dark valued objects. And mm -hmm. so that fits right in with the lighting. Yeah, can, can we put in our show notes that sequence of illustrations you did? I don't know. I think it was for a class or whatever, but it's, it's uh -huh. an outdoor scene with the snow. And it starts out an ambient light scene and then you have oh, all yeah, these yeah, different yeah. lighting things. He's, he did the same scene like he's talking about, like five different ways with different yeah. lighting and stuff. So cool. Yeah, It was really cool. And you can, I think you can tell a lot about your own illustration sensibilities depending on which one of those you like. There was one with really bright light and one with kind of cool light. And then I liked the one with just the ambient light, which was yeah. no light, which yeah. I did too. exactly what I was saying. And I remember when you said that and I was thinking, because I, I go hiking in the snow a lot and there's a lot of days that are just those overcast days where, and they're really cool because objects seem like they're floating almost yeah. when you're dealing with snow. Cause there's no cast shadows sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. You've you got to post that. Cause that's a cool, that's a cool assignment to do. If you guys have ever had it where you just take one scene and just illustrate it a couple of different ways based on only lighting. I do that a lot in the concept design classes and it's, it's always yeah. so much fun to do that. Yeah. Cool. By the way, an attic ladder costs about $272. From Home Depot. That's my oh, research. Installed. And they're called an attic ladder. An clever. Attic. Is clever. That, is that installed? That's not installed. That's just purchased. Okay. All right. Last. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't say we don't teach it, people. We just taught about lighting <laughs> and attic ladders. We've had a lot of comments of people saying that they feel like they're hanging out with us. Mm -hmm. And we love that idea. We're just a yeah. couple of couple of guys hanging out yeah, this, is our, this is actually what our normal <laughs> business meetings are like anyway yeah we just did a two-hour <laughs> business meeting before this that was uh we were all over the place 
Yeah. We weren't, we were really focused. No, that, that was a good one. So that was a good one. Pats on the back. <laughs> Lots of cool things happening with SVS Learn coming up. Just to let you know, svslearn.com. <laughs> Two hours worth of meeting time stuff spent on that stuff. Yeah. So it's a lot. We have big, big plans for the future. So let me just say this. You're going to want to be a subscriber if you're not already. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Number nine, show something impossible becoming a reality. You know, this is just just from the, the 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 ground up. If you really want to add some sort of story to your image, show something that is impossible that couldn't happen, that is sort of becoming a reality. So, I one great example of this is like M. C. Escher's um, crazy trippy paintings, right? I guess they're not; they're drawings, where he does like the staircase that's going up continually, but it it loops back into itself or the waterfall that's falling down and turning a, a wheel that's feeding the waterfall. Right. And then becomes a duck later. Like yeah, as it goes <laughs> duck. Yeah. <And> geese. <laughs> um, I saw an illustration of like a man um, watering some flowers up on, you know, on, on a higher tier that he couldn't reach just by standing, but he turned the hose into a staircase, like just steps. So he could, climb up the hose. Mm -hmm. I feel like when I look at both my work, your work and Lee's, your Will's work and Lee's work. <laughs> I don't know why I, I did it that way. <laughs> <laughs> your work and, and Lee's work. Anyways, when I look at our, all three of our work, I feel like Lee's is the most whimsical in this, this sense where he does stuff that's more, um, impossible things becoming reality. You want to talk about that, Lee, why you go there? Well, what I like, how I get there is illogical solutions for logical problems. Mm, I like that. That's cool. And it's an easy one to grab onto. Like, Wait, the, wait, wait, wait. Let's not go into politics right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the books that, uh, that, I, that I'm writing right now is, is uh, I can't go into that one. So I'm going to have to I'm going to have to pull that one until, until late it gets, it gets published because it's under some okay. contractual things. I'm going to tell you the guy, you guys to go research this other dude. It looks like his name is pronounced Bill Out. Guy Bill Out. G-U-I-B-I-L-L-O-E-G. You guys know him? How do you pronounce that name? G-B-U. He does this all the time. His image, he just adds one little thing. Like it'll be two people walking on a, on a beach and somebody's like kind of lifting up the water, like they're looking under a bed sheet or something. And it just changes the whole nature of the illustration. And he's just wonderful at adding this What's one this little thing. Guy, G-U-I, Bill, B-I-L-L-O-U-T, Bill Out. But it's he's, he's a G -U -I. master at this. He's so good. He's had a lot of imitators too. Yeah, nobody, nobody can pull it off like he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've man, seen he's guy. so good. And he's so simple. Like he doesn't even need that much because he's so technically i think solid and the conceptually solid that he doesn't need a lot of decoration to it um, i think he does it perfectly mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. he brings something unexpected to the images and that's what that's what i like about him and that's what i try to do in my work as well it's just like what why i always ask myself why am i drawing this piece it, what makes this interesting and if i can't answer that i keep working on more thumbnails until i can find some kind of quality that you're not seeing every day and I've seen so, especially in children's books, you know, that's one of the things we focus on is that so many children's book illustrators, they, they, for lack of a better example, they use like, oh, this is a happy bunny family and they're making cookies. Like, that's just so not interesting. It's sweet, but there's nothing interesting about it because we've kind of, it, all it is is sweet. There's nothing in, engaging about that. Mm -hmm. So you need yeah, to get, well, go ahead, Jay. I, I was just going to say, yeah, what, there's no story there. That right there is like, it's just overly climax. sweet. Yeah. yeah, it's just overly sweet and there's not much storytelling with it too. So like you think have to come this, up with something. Think about this illustration. It's a family of bunnies. They're all laying on the floor. Their stomachs are just massive. And you see like they ate way too many cookies, right? There's just like evidence all <laughs> that they ate too That's much. That's a better one. <laughs> right? Like that tells a story. Yeah, one right? of them, the dad is injecting himself with some insulin and... and <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> All right, we want to see some reader illustrations about this bunny family and uh, make them interesting. <laughs> you got to come up with something. There has to be some hook to it, whether it's the environment or, mm -hmm. you know, I had an assignment when, I, when we were doing um, concept art at the Art Institute of Portland where the, we were doing environments and it had to be, we, 
I wanted to, them to draw a treehouse, but I realized once I started doing research on treehouses that like every single treehouse is shown in the summer. And so the assignment was draw a treehouse in winter. And it, it, it just added so much to how these things felt. They felt abandoned and they felt lonely and they felt just so different than they do in the summertime. Mm. Just like my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a sound effect on that. That was pretty good. Can oh, we still have those sound effects? Here we go. Oh, oh, you got you to be ready go. with that drum hit, man. Uh, <laughs> no, I had a great childhood. Actually, I didn't see snow. Actually, see or touch snow until... I grew up in Arizona, by the way. I didn't see it or touch it until I was... I want to say 11, 11 years old. Wow. You're one of those guys. The That's only experience I had was, was movies like Empire Strikes Back, you know, anything like that. So when I saw the snow, we were going up, we were up north, northern Arizona. I saw a pile of snow on the side. I ran over. I'm like, I'm making a snowball. I started doing it. I didn't have mittens on. And all of a sudden I was like shocked at how cold it was. I didn't realize <laughs> snow was like, freezing cold <laughs> my just, I was like ah what's wrong with this stuff <laughs> my, my students in California see you got us on a tangent again when we were living out there we would go snowboarding and they had been every kid in town because we were like we were like three hours away a lot of them had only been to the snow once or twice mm -hmm. and they call it going to the snow yeah up above Fresno wow and and uh, the snow parks up there are lower than the ski resort and they always it, it always gets warm out there and then it melts and then it freezes. So you might have snow that looks like rolling hills, fluffy snow, but it is hard as concrete. And oh, so wow. they would always ask us, like, how do you snowboard? Like, doesn't it hurt when you fall and stuff like that? I'm like, <laughs> I thought it was all much. ice. Like they didn't Yeah, understand. they thought it was all ice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I'm just going to read through this list one more time. We'll wrap, wrap it up. Just Let's so do it. Let's do this. So how to tell a story with your art. Number one, make sure every image should spur a question in the viewer. Okay. Number two, every image should elicit some kind of emotional response from the, from the viewer. You know, does it make him happy? Does it make him sad? Does it make him curious? Number three, always include a character or at least evidence of a character. Number four, use small details to hint at more depth to the situation. Number five, avoid the climax or don't show you know, show the before, or show the after. Number six, use composition and point of view to tell the story. Number seven, give the viewer something to explore. Number eight, use lighting to tell the, the story. And number nine, show something impossible becoming a reality. And is there anything else y'all want to add to this? Uh, no, that's pretty much good yeah, somebody, okay. somebody can do all that with their images they have learned something they are doing yeah, that's for sure that's for sure okay everybody thank you for joining us three point perspective is made possible by svslearn.com where becoming a great illustrator starts and uh check it out subscribe now uh, good things coming along down the pipeline for subscribers lots of uh classes and courses to improve your, your drawing abilities so go check that out um uh, let's talk about who we are. Uh, this is our hosts have been, I'm totally like <laughs> derailed here. Your hosts have been Will Terry. You can find him at willterry.com. His artwork, his portfolio is online there. Also follow him on Instagram at Will Terry Art. Uh, we've got Lee White at his, uh, his website is leewhiteillustration.com and follow him on Instagram at leewhiteillo. And I'm Jake Parker. You can find my work at mrjakeparker.com and follow me on Instagram at Jake Parker on Instagram. Show is the, the podcast is edited by Alex Sugg. Uh, you can find his work or contact him about edit, editing your podcast at alexsugg.com. And show notes by Tanner Garlic. Uh, Tanner is our, uh, just been helping us out here for a couple of years. We, we appreciate him and go check out his work. Tanner he does Garlic. all the nice artwork for the podcast too. Yeah, all the nice artwork too. TannerGarlicArt.com. So if you like this episode, 
please share it around. Um, send this episode to all your illustrator friends who don't tell stories with their artwork. They need this. They need to hear this episode. And uh, if you can subscribe to it somewhere on iTunes, if you, if you like it enough to want to listen to more, subscribe to it wherever you subscribe to a podcast. That way you get notified every time we upload a new podcast. And if you'd be so kind as to just leave a review, we would love that these episodes, not these episodes, podcasts like kind of live or die by, by reviews and word of mouth. So we'd love to have you share that around. Um, there's a, a discussion about this particular subject matter happening on the svslearn.com forums, which are free to join. And if you want to join in on that discussion, log on to those forums at svslearn.com and uh, give us a piece of your mind on how to tell a story with art, or if you disagree with anything we've said, we'd love to know. Um, Okay, that's it. Thank you, everybody. We will see you next time. All right. All right, we're out. So all the little, uh, the little heads poking up thing that didn't record by the way, because it only records the person who's talking. Oh, so oh, you're kidding. So my pencil action didn't get not unless you're talking. No, I would never it's, be doing this one. <laughs> so it's super annoying for the people who don't know what's going on. And we're referring to, to that. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Are you still recording this meeting or is it a meeting? Done? I'm still recording zoom. Oh, okay. I wonder if we can change a setting where it just records all three of us the whole time. Probably. Yeah. That's super it. annoying. God, they, they, always, they always make it us to having to do extra work. <laughs> it's never just easy, like press a button, like, oh, yeah, that's what I wanted. It's never like that. I'm sure there's another, there's other formats that you can do. So. Yeah.